possible because the lion from the tribe of Judah became the Lamb of God on your behalf so that you can become a child of God. This is the good news. This is the one who's worthy of your worship. So Father God, we thank you for the word of God. I ask that you speak to us today life. Speak to us today life through your word, Lord. We don't take your word lightly, Lord. And Lord, I ask that today that you would encourage those who need encouragement. You would challenge those who need to be challenged. You would correct those who need to be corrected. And you would strengthen those who need to be strengthened by your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. How many of your parents? Let me see the hands. Parents in the room. I know some of you are parents who aren't raising your hands, so I can see some of you, okay? Anyone, parents, raise your hand. Okay, look at that cooperation. They only had to call one person out. Amen. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny when, you, as a parent, what will happen, you know, in the different seasons with your children. Uh, if, how many of you just have one and it's, it's, they're under three? You have one, one child or two children. or the, How many of your children are under three? Okay. Okay, awesome. So for those of you who are in the room and your children, you only have one and they're under three, it kind of catches you off guard when they shift to a new season. All your parenting has to change, all these different things. And what, what your discipline or your correction or your instruction once looked like has to completely change. And the kids are caught off guard. Like my kids are in the midst of transition. They're in the room. And so I'm sure they love that I'll bring them into this. Um, is, <laughs> so is that, you know, they expect things to be fair. How many of you parents, you know, this isn't fair? No. They expect fairness. I said, that's not fair. Life's not fair. But also, what's, what would, it would be unfair to treat someone who's younger the same as someone older. But when you're a kid, you don't understand that. You go, no. You, you, the correction should be the same. I said, no, 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 no. The reward, you know, we think for certain things, reward should be the same. I said, no, 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 no. This isn't how it works, right? The, the, the reward if you're 25 and you have a job is different than when you're seven and you have a responsibility, a job, you know, take out the garbage. It's like the reward is different, right? And the consequences or the, the entrustment is different. So we, we want things to be fair and the same, but they never are. But as we mature, we realize that, and we go, oh, that, that makes sense. But when you're a kid, so like, for example, this week, Ezra went to the dentist, and Ezra had to get a, 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 some work at the dentist, and he didn't want to. He didn't like it. Like, I don't want them touching me, right? So he's like, huh, huh, huh. And so they had to call mom, right? I'm not there, and... And uh, Mary, where's Mary? Pray for Mary. Mary had to take him. And uh, all right, we leave this Friday for Africa and we got different stuff. And so Mary's taking him and uh, we had another appointment a couple weeks ago. I took him, he did great. Now Mary, of course, mom and dad's not there. So she has to call mom and, you know, mom's like, okay, what, you know, be strong. You know, what can we, you know, do? And he's like, you know, you bribing him, right? So I don't do that. I don't, I'm not, no, there's no bribing, okay? You just... Just, you got this. So mom bribes him. And uh, she says, okay, DQ or whatever, right? So, so of course, after, he's like, yeah, go for it. You know, he's like, yeah, yeah I got this. So, so she, Mary gets him an ice, the ice cream, but the big one. You know what I mean? The, the large one. I didn't even know they sold him like that, right? The, the, the blizzard comes in apparently a Slurpee cup. You know what I mean? It's like, what in the world? So, of course, he's finished with it, but he brings the cup home just so he can, you know, throw it away, but make sure all the siblings see, you know. He's like, yeah, I just got to throw my blizzard cup away. I don't know if it'll fit in this garbage can, so I might have to put it outside, you know. So, it's like, so then, of course, Nehemiah's like, this is unjust, and there needs to be, there needs to be a hearing about this situation. <laughs> Because this is not fair. You know? so, so he's recalling his history. And uh, I went to the dentist not too long ago. I didn't get anything. You know, and so we need justice to be served on my behalf is what he's dealing with. And so, you know, this is how kids, we, 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 
we act, right? We, we, we go through things and we want it to be exactly how it is for one, for us. And so that's not how it works. Even as you get older, the, the consequences for certain behaviors are different than the same, in a sense, action when you're way younger, right? So it's never, it's never fair. And how we provide even for our children changes over time. What is, what, as a parent, I feed my children, I clothe my children, I put a roof over my children, but there will be a day that that is no longer how I will respond to their need. Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if, if, you know, if your parents just fit the bill forever, for the rest of your life, the bill was just on your parents. That'd be so nice. It, it, it actually wouldn't be. Because you would never mature. You would never grow up. You would never become. They would become, but you wouldn't become. So there's certain things we don't do anymore, not because we don't love, right? Well, I loved you then, and now I don't do those things because I don't love you now. That's not the case, is it? No, it just, this is more responsibility as you mature. And less responsibility, in a sense, on certain areas, on me, so that you can mature. My response is different for you, not against you. Okay, this is the same with God. But we want God to, to kind of respond to us like he did the day we got saved all the way into the future. We just would like that, for him to stay the same. And the Bible says he does stay the same, but I want you to know something. He doesn't change in the sense of his nature. But God actually has different... The, 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 I call it like kaleidoscopic. You ever seen a kaleidoscope? You look through it, and it's beautiful, and it's so many, and it's different. It's so amazing. You can't really put your finger on it. It's so amazing. It's too much. Two different colors and different things happening. God is in that way a father, a savior, a king, a lord. He wants to be a friend. He wants to be the bridegroom. He has different natures that have to be expressed in different seasons with you as you mature. So just as my relationship with my children will change as they mature, I haven't changed. My love hasn't changed. But how I relate to them does change. Not against them, it's for them. So what I did yesterday for them, I'm not fitting the dentist bill in the future. There will be a day I don't fit that bill. That's on them. When we go shopping, when we go grocery shopping, not that I can't, not that I wouldn't be willing to, but at some point they need to, to, to take that on and they need to mature in that way. And it's gradual. It's gradual. So the same is with God. Otherwise, you wouldn't change. You wouldn't mature. And this is why this is a family, is because God's intent is that you would mature. So, but oftentimes, it's in the shifting of the relationship that many of us will begin to feel because we don't know the truth. We don't know this part of the growing. So then we're like, oh, where's God? No, 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 he's not, he's not being Savior right now. He's being Lord. So the, the severity of God is a gift to you in those moments where he's teaching you to trust him as Lord. He's saying, I need you to walk away from that thing. And you're going, he's Lord. Meaning he gets to make those, the decision that that's right. And you go, I need to walk away from this thing over here. Relationship, job, whatever it is, because the Lord, the King, that person, he makes the rules. And then we conform to them because we trust him in that way. Yes. And the severity of what he'll require changes yes. as he becomes Lord of all lords in our lives. Hey. 
he'll be down here, and he's like, oh, I just want you to do this. You're like, oh, I can do that. And then he's like, I want you to do this. If he did that the first day, you're like, oh, no, I'm scared. But he's maturing you into the fact that he's the Lord of Lords. For some of you, he's Lord. But he wants to be Lord of Lords. Okay? So that, that, that grows, and he'll require, and he'll speak oftentimes as a father to help you to the next, and then, okay? So the different relationships that, and the natures of God will change, not that he's changing, he's all of those at the same time, but how he'll relate to you will change to bring you into the fullness of the image. His image is inside of you. He, he made you in his image and his likeness, but he wants to conform you to his image and his likeness. It's in there, he wants to bring it out. Okay, the, 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 a diamond doesn't look like a diamond, uh, what we think a diamond looks like when it's in the earth. But God is unearthing it. He begins to cut it. He begins to shape it. He begins to form it. He begins to polish it until one day he goes, ah, will you look at it? It was always a diamond. But it always wasn't as beautiful as the one who's conforming the diamond. You know, Clay is the same way. We have to unearth it. The different process of clay. No one likes it. The clay probably doesn't like it when the potter is is, is, is working the, the clay to get all of the air out of the clay. They have to work it, work it, and then they find the piece they want, cut it, and <laughs> slam it down on the potter's wheel and begin to shape it, dry it, put it in the kiln and fire it, then paint it and fire it one more time. Ah, oh, look at it, it's beautiful, okay? So, so, actually, they only fire it once, they paint it after they dry it. But anyway, so, so, so this is this, 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 this imagery of what we're going through. But I want to, to show you in the scriptures this process that we're all on. Because there's two things that can happen in the process. God has an intent, but listen, there is a rebel who has an intent. There's one who's a rebel against God and against you. And in the midst of what God's trying to do, he has his own agenda. And many, 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 in the midst of these transitions, fail to see who's at work and which voice to follow. So I want, I want, I want today for us to be able to see how God operates so that we can know what's going on, which voice to listen to, what is the Father's voice, who's speaking, is it the bridegroom, is it the Lord, who, and then who's the, what the rebel sounds like. So if we see it all the way in the beginning, we have God who makes a good world and he gives this garden that he makes and he puts man in. He gives them to govern with him. But there's two trees, there's a bunch of trees, but two main trees that are enlightened by the, the, the author, Moses, who is telling us what happened in the beginning. And he says there was this tree of life and man, in this tree of life, this is just wisdom and life and all these things. Everything that's in God is in here and we'll, we're to take and eat of it. It's amazing. But there's this other tree as well. It's kind of a shortcut to the tree of life. But it's really a tree of death. You'll get wisdom, some of the things that you'll get in here, but it comes with another thing. And this is easy to go and, 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 and take from. In a sense, let's say the tree of life is on top of, of, of one of the mountains over here that we get to look at, you know. It, it is a, it's a climb. There's a process to get to it, but it's worth it. The result of it is wonderful. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is just right here. So, so the deceiver, Satan, comes and, and he's a rebel against God and against them. And, and he's, he, he begins to, to get them to, to, to question whether or not God has... It, it, the way God wants to do things, is it really the best way? You can just get it right here. He, he's going to make you hike that mountain. What kind of father is that? What kind of God is that? No, just eat this one. No, he said we'll die. No, he, he's just, he just knows that you'll become like him, knowing both good and evil. Don't, don't worry about it. You, you. So this is this deception. And God permits this. So I want you to see in the midst of this image, you have a theme that goes all the way through the scriptures and it's active right now in your life. God presents 
to Adam and Eve a test. And the rebel presents it as a trap. So I want you to know that in every season you go through, in every season you, you, you will live on this earth, you are being presented with both a test and a trap. The ones presenting it are two different people. God is presenting before you a test. And Satan is using that test and he's trying to change it into a trap. Adam and Eve were given a test. God saying, I want you to reign with me. But first I have to see what's in you. I'm going to test you to see what's in you. Put these two trees here. There's an option. There's a choice. And that choice, how will you govern? How will you reign with me? How will you live this test to see what's in you, to see what, how much I can really trust you? Satan sees it as a wonderful opportunity to trap them. So many of the things that are before you right now, you just see as a trap. You don't pass through the test because you think it's just a trap. But really, we have to put our eyes off of just the fact that it's a trap, recognize it is a trap, but also, what is the test? How would God have him pass this test? Some of you, you don't even realize there's a trap or a test. You just think, I'm in marriage, and you know, this is a trap or whatever. I'm just joking. But <laughs> you're being tested. Your children are a test to you. Many of you, your jobs right now are a test to you. You're being tested. Not having a job for some of you, being tested. The abundance of your finances can be a test. This, the, the lacking of finances can be a test. And in all of it, it can also be a trap. For you to change how you view God because of your circumstances. How will you choose to see God in the midst of your circumstances? God permits many things that the church, no matter what kind of church it is, we will paint God a certain way that we like him. We admit, some churches, they, they don't think God tests. You know, they say, oh yeah, God tests you, but certain things, they say, that's not a test. God doesn't test you with that. And I go, well, listen. The Spirit of God sends Jesus into the wilderness, it says, to be tempted. God is testing him. Satan is tempting him. But the Spirit sent him to be tempted, to be tested I don't like that. That's not, God's not afraid of Satan. Listen, we have this thing that maybe there's this big war between the two of them. God is not afraid of Satan. There is no competition between the two of them. There really isn't. There's not like a, God's going, I'm working out, I'm getting ready because you know, you're going to fight, fight that Satan. He's like, no, I actually defeated him at my weakest moment 2,000 years ago on the cross. But will you? Listen, Jesus goes in by the Spirit to a test, which Satan uses as a trap, but Jesus passed the test. It's before ministry. So I want you to see, many of you, you, you want to grow. You want God, especially some of you who are in the school of ministry, your first year, you want the second year. You go, give me that, let me cast out devils and heal the sick and breach the lost. You know, you guys have been holding me back. <laughs> no, no, we want you to hear the, the river moment when heavens open and say, my son in whom I'm well pleased. So when the deceiver comes and says, if you really are the son, then, no, 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 no. This isn't how God works. No, no, no. We got Amber Alert? What do we have? What is it? We command every devil operating through this person to be bound now. And for the fear of the Lord God Almighty to come upon them and for them to release this child now in the name of Jesus. We send angels 
that the fear of the Lord would fill that vehicle right now and for that child to be released alive and well in Jesus mighty name amen not today Satan so this is this is what's what's Jesus is 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 understanding he understands what he's under many of you you're facing things right now you don't know that you're being tested and you don't know it's a trap so you don't treat it as such so you fail how many of you know that if you go in to uh, back in 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 in, in school uh, what grade ninth grade you will have tests math tests English tests history tests right you'll have those things if you have a teacher who tells you hey tomorrow we have tests on sections so such and such you want to prepare so you pass the test how many of you had pop quizzes <laughs> right how many of you know we don't you don't do as good on pop tests if you don't do the, the the study beforehand right but when a teacher is kind enough to let you know you have a test you can get ready for the test you treat it like a test, you get ready for the test so that you pass the test. Many of you, every day is a pop quiz because you don't know that there's a test. I'm here to tell you there's a test. I want you to pass the test. God wants you to pass the test. He wants you to see in his scripture that he does give tests. I'm here as your shepherd to say there's a test. I want you to evaluate your life so that you can see where you're being tested. And see how Satan's using it as a trap. I want you to see if you're succeeding in the test. I want you to evaluate whether or not there's areas right now you have allowed yourself to be trapped. And what it is that we must do to come out of the trap and come back into the test. Adam and Eve, they failed the test. And they fell into the trap. Abraham is tested. God gives him a promise and then makes him wait. Test. Does he pass it? He fails. He waited too long. His wife got impatient. He got impatient. So they tried to go and make a son for themselves. They fail. God is merciful. Gives him another shot. Gives them a son anyways. He says, it's not that son, it's this son that I gave, not the one you went and tried to get yourself. Come on. And then he gives them another test. Take your son, your only son. He didn't recognize the other one. He said, no, this son, the one I gave you, the promise, and take him and go. That time, did he pass the test? Yes. He passed the test. Now he knows there's a test. He's like, oh, there's, this is, I think this is, a, let's go. Hey, we're going to the mountain. There's, there's a test. I will not fail the test this time. I'm sure Sarah is going, no, 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 it's okay. Give it a week. He's like, Sarah, get it. You know, I'm not listening to you this time. We're going to pass the test. And he passed the test. So what test are you under right now? And how is the devil or Satan trying to turn it into a trap. Have you fallen for the trap? I'm going to talk in a second about our responses and some of the things that God is, is wanting from us in the midst of this, but I want to read something to you. It says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We'll read through it. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to the abundant mercy has begotten, has, has birthed us, again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, defiled. And that does not fade away, but is reserved in heaven for you who are kept, what are we kept by? The power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. So God is keeping us by his power, but there's something on our side, that's our faith. But look what it goes on to say. In this greatly rejoice, everyone say rejoice. rejoice. 
Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various, say it with me, trials. This is the test. That the, so God has a purpose, that, right? You can circle, underline that. You have a trial that the genuineness of your faith, which is what preserves you by the power, God wants to produce something. He wants the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Everyone say Fire. Fire. May be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy. Inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving, this is the goal, the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Listen. Listen. He says the test is like fire is to gold to purify your faith so your faith brings you to the end which is the salvation of your soul. So God wants to test you to burn away what is what is refining gold do burn away the impurities so it may be beautiful and may be glorious. He says I want you to be glorious. So I'll let fire come to test what really is there so that it will perfect you. As James 1, 2, we talked about last week. Count it all. What does he say here? Joy. When you go through the testing of your faith, knowing that it produces patience and endurance, but let it have its full work. You may be perfect, right? Glorious and complete, lacking nothing. So God does this. He tests us. He allows trials the test comes in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the form of a trial. The test comes in the form of a trial. None of us like trials. But he says, no, 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 rejoice in the midst of trials because God is doing something. I want you to see this as well in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 8. Every command which I command you today must be carefully observed that... You may live and multiply. God gives a way to live so that they may what? Multiply. Live and multiply. Here's how you ought to live so that you may live and that in living you may multiply. What do you say? Multiply and subdue. I want you to reign with me. I want you to multiply in doing so. So go and to go on and possess the land. This is an imagery of our salvation. So he gives us how we ought to live so that we may possess the land he wants to give us. Which the Lord swore to your fathers. You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way the 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus went to the wilderness for 40 days to pass the test that Israel failed in the wilderness. But look what the test was trying to do in the wilderness. So he's using this as an image of a test. He says, God led you into the wilderness. And he led you through the wilderness for those 40 years. But by the way, he didn't want them to be in the wilderness for 40 years. That was because they failed the test the first time. And he gave them another shot. But it was to humble you and, what does it say? Test you. To know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his command or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger. And then he fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, meaning it was far beyond before. And when it came, they didn't understand it. They didn't didn't know, but God was providing for them, for their hunger, for their need. That he might take you, that he might make you to know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God or the Lord. Listen, what did Jesus say to Satan when he tried to get him to eat in the wilderness? He said this words. This is where he reached to, Deuteronomy chapter 8. God was trying to teach Israel that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from his mouth. So when Satan comes and says, just take and eat, he says, I don't eat bread alone. 
I eat the word of God. I have food you don't know of, disciples. It's to do the will of my Father. And God's trying to teach you the same thing. If you are in need financially, God's trying to teach you something. It's a test. It's not that he's like, oh man, the 15th's coming. I'll for sure, I'll get paid. I'll be able to help you out. <laughs> God already owns everything. Hey. He could speak and there could be gold just appear. Yeah, that's right. he, doesn't, he, he can just speak it and it would be there. So then what? And knowing this is a test even in itself. If you're in need and you don't have what you need and you know that your father has what you need, it's a test. Because you can judge him and say, he doesn't care about me. How did Israel fail the test? They judged God. Here's what not to do. You can write this down in the midst of a test. Accuse God. And prescribe a judgment to him that's not true. He doesn't care about us. If he cared, he would have left us in Egypt where there was food. Or he would have gave us food here. He doesn't love us. He doesn't care about us. Where is God? It would be better if we would have stayed there. He brought us out here to die. That's what they did. And some of you are judging them. But right now you're doing the same thing. You're accusing God. Because he didn't move when you wanted him to move or how you wanted him to move. And you forgot about Job. The same test came to Job. The severity of the test may never approach any of us. But he was tested. Satan used it as a trap. God permitted for a test. And Job goes through a test like none of us would ever want to go through a test. And God at the end of it gives back to him. The scripture goes on to say here, it says here, your garments didn't wear out, nor did your feet swell. I want you to see that when Jared, Pastor Jared uh, spoke about during uh, the moment of, of, of tithe and offerings, he said, James 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things should be added unto you. The verse before is he also read, saying that don't worry about what? What you'll eat, what you'll wear, or don't worry about those things. Why? God already in the wilderness says, I fed you when you were hungry. Your garments didn't wear out. Your feet didn't even swell. Everything he says don't worry about, he already showed them to be faithful. They just needed to search their history. Wow. You might be in a wilderness season, but he says, search your history. I've already shown myself to be faithful in that way. You said, not to me, no, to his covenant. Are you in his covenant? Yeah. Then every person he's been faithful to the covenant, he'll be the same to you. It goes on to say, he says, verse 16, Deuteronomy chapter 8, he fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, and he humbled you and, and tested you, but to do good in the end. But to do good in the end. His intent was to bring him into the promise, but the test was first. God has a promise for you, but you will be tested when you pass the test. For some of you, it's your marriage. For some of you, it's your children. For some of you, right now, it's your devotional time. You want to go on to greater things. And he goes, you won't even meet with me in the morning. Why would I give you that? Come. Be with me. Ah, I'm busy. I got all this stuff. You know I love you. You already know that. He says, well, we'll get to that when you're ready to pass this test. Why would I give you that? It would ruin you if you don't abide here. You'd never be able to hold that if you don't learn to abide here. This is where the strength that comes to carry that comes from. But you have to go. So I just wrote a couple things down, and I have too many verses, and we're going to end here in a second. But... 
I, I, I wrote a couple things down. I want you to write these things down. This is just for you to, to examine this week because I, I can't give you uh, everything that uh, you need in this. And this isn't an exhaustive thing, but I want you to, to write a couple. Here's what not to do. Don't complain and don't blame God, one. Don't be discontent. Don't forget about his faithfulness. And don't sin by turning away and trying to take it into your own hands. So what should we do then? Yeah, don't complain or blame God. Don't prescribe judgment to God. Right? Here's what he's really doing. Don't misjudge God. Don't be discontent. Right? Miss what he's actually already providing. Don't forget of his faithfulness. And don't turn away and try to take it into your own hands and doing so sin and fail the test. This is what Abraham did, right? He turned and took it into his own hands. All right, what should we do? Well, if you just look at James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, what is he, uh, uh, 5 and 6 as well, what does he say to do? First thing he says is rejoice. Oh, this is a test. <laughs> How can I rejoice? I would rejoice if I was out of the trial. No, he says, if you're in trial, rejoice. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Giving thanks to God. Rejoice. At what? That's why I said, search your history. How do you rejoice? Search your history. Search the promise. Realize it's a test and that God is perfecting you. You say, oh, I'm going to count it joy. God is doing something. He's making me something. He's getting ready for my breakthrough. And this is the test. And I shall pass the test. Rejoice. In your rejoicing, it will cause something. Patience. But patience is, you know, it's a work. To wait, to be patient. Abraham, so you write this, wait. Be patient. That's, that's what he prescribes. Rejoicing will cause you to be able to wait. To be patient. God is not slow as some assume him to be. He's working some stuff out. Come on. For your good. Yeah. So wait. And as you wait, pray. What does he say to the church before he comes and gives them the promise of the Holy Ghost? Wait. What did they do? They prayed. And in their waiting and in their prayer, they came into unity and the gift and the promise came. So while you wait, pray, rejoice, thank God. In doing so, you'll be remembering your history to thank him. This is why I say at the beginning of the service, when we go into this thing, don't just jump in and just say stuff. I don't, I really dislike it. I really, I catch myself doing it. This is why I'm saying it is we just, great is the Lord, and we just say stuff. Inside, we're just like, I'm going to have that hamburger at JR's for sure. You know, we're not, we're not thinking about the Lord. We're not thinking about the Lord. We're thinking about our bellies. We're still thinking about how our kids didn't get in the car, and now we're late. We're thinking about how they, every day you need to tell them to put their shoes on, and they go, I don't know where my shoes are. They're on the ceiling. You know, you're, that's what you're still thinking about. And you're just like, ah, I just say, stop, put that stuff aside and search your history. Begin to meditate on his faithfulness. Rejoicing will begin to overflow. You'll forget about your trial. It'll cause you to be able to wait. Because you stop trying to solve it because you know God already is. So pray. It'll cause you to persevere. Sometimes there's a perseverance. Sometimes there's a, a need to persevere, long suffer. He doesn't take it off because the work hasn't been done. The more fire is needed for you and for your good. There's certain situations that shall, in a sense, be quick tests, and then there's longer tests. There's quick tests, and there's longer tests. Your marriage is a long test, and it needs perseverance church it needs perseverance 
You'll learn to love like him and become loved like he is because he gave you a long test. It might have started as a trap, but you made a covenant. <laughs> God will redeem it. You made a covenant. He'll honor the covenant and he'll redeem it. So don't you be trying to leave now what you made a covenant in. It just you got a bigger cross than someone else, but you'll be more beautiful. Someone else might have their heaven here. You'll have yours there. You've been refined. It's for your good. Okay. Your children. Not as long as the marriage, but a long test. It's a long test. That one, <laughs> that could be a hard test. Okay, listen. And the test doesn't end. It gets a little bit, in a sense, as they get older, some of those tests keep going, but... When they're young, and they know everything, <laughs> they have all the answers, there's a test. How are you, are you winning, the, are you victorious in the test? Are you allowing the Spirit of God to teach you how to be like Him? Yeah, wow, that neighbor or that coworker, it's a test. I've told you many times about every season I've ever been in with work, I had someone, even, you know, in these seasons now, someone who's a test. And I'm like, Lord, I already passed this test. You keep sending me harder people. And he's like, I'm maturing you for your good. Okay, okay, it's for my good. He says in the midst of prayer, going to the pray one, he says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. So in your prayers, I want you to just put, ask for wisdom. I need wisdom every single day. You know, kings govern my wisdom. And for those things you've been given authority in your marriage, in your workplace, with your kids or whatever it is, to govern and to walk rightly, you need God's wisdom. How would he do this? That's his wisdom. In the midst of your spouse testing you or setting a trap for you, you're going to wear that. I'm just joking. You know, so it's, it's like we have tests. How, how, how you know, you, my wife can make a dinner. My mind is somewhere else. I should be grateful. She's like, hey, dinner's ready. And I don't, I don't respond. I'm trying to finish something. Dinner's ready. The Lord is faithful to lead me through this trap. <laughs> Look at this wonderful meal. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Sorry for, make, uh, for making you wait. You're so amazing. <laughs> Jesus. And, then, you know, we, there's many, many, many uh, of these times. You tell your kids to come, and they say, I'm busy. Lord, don't let me set a trap. <laughs> so we, we need to recognize that every single day we need to ask, we need to pray, we need to seek the Lord, we need to ask God for help. We need to ask him for wisdom. Some of you single people, be careful. Some of you are coming into relationships. Now, there's relationships before. Be careful. What God might be giving and testing in the midst of, Satan is also trying to use. And with the disciples, I helped counsel. That's something to do. Seek counsel. You put that down. In the midst of waiting, in the midst of the trial, seek counsel. God has given you people to go and seek counsel from. Kings would go and seek prophets. God is in the midst of a test, and they would go and seek counsel. Seek counsel. But don't be like those kings when the prophet comes and gives his counsel. They, you never give me good news. Get out of here. Kill him. Stone him. You know, it's like, no, you didn't hear what you wanted to hear, but you heard what God was saying. You didn't hear it. You rejected it. Don't be rebellious. They love you. Children, listen to your parents. They only have your good in mind. 
But it might not seem at first good. It might not seem good. And those boys and those girls, stay away from them. <laughs> it's a trap. It's a trap. Everyone said? It's a trap. <sighs> we'll see who has ears to hear. Okay, so I want to pray for you. Um, these are the four, I just wrote these things down. One, sometimes God wants you to wait. Abraham should have waited. He failed the test. Sometimes God is telling you to go. That's the second test. Time to go. Will you go? When I was planted the first church seven years, God said, go. Meaning, let this down, new season. They said, I had finances. I had all kinds. I built a house. I had all these things. I'm walking away from my job to go and start a new work that might not provide anything for my family? My answer was yes. There was no, there's no human evidence that there would be any way I'd be able to take care of my family. I don't care. My job is to obey the one who is my actual provider, even when he doesn't show me because I searched my history. I knew he is a provider. He is faithful and he will continue to be faithful. So my answer was yes. But in that same season before he said go, there was a waiting. There was contention. And people around me who were on my team said, let's go already. And I said, I will not go without the voice of the Lord. Yeah. If he not be with me, I will not go. I will stay in the midst of, this is miserable, this is hard, this is terrible, let's just go. They don't even want us here. God wants me here. Yeah. And I will endure this test until he releases me. Because my life is not my own. Yeah. And I rejoice in the midst of fire. Because I'm being purified. So sometimes you just need to go because he speaks to you. I would say seek counsel. Three, sometimes it's to resist. Sometimes the test is just to see if you'll resist. Resist the devil and he will. Yeah, sometimes it's just to resist. And sometimes, number four, it's to run. Samson should have ran. Shouldn't just resist. He should run. Sometimes there's a test and the solution is not to wait, it's to run. It's not to wait and pray. Maybe, maybe the Lord has this person for it. No. If he would have searched the word of God, he would have known the word of God says not to be with a woman like this. And he would not have waited. He would not have prayed. He would have not have sought counsel. He would have ran because he sought the counsel of the word of God already. Yeah, Amen. So hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against him. Amen. So those are the four things. I just, uh, let's just take a second with Holy Spirit, and I want him just to bring to your heart, to your mind. If you're in a test right now, how many tests you're under, sometimes it's multiple, like I said, marriage and children and your work and in, in, in dating, in school, you got that teacher, you got um, uh, your parents, you're a kid and you, you have your parents and you feel like, man, if they just you know, would just understand and they're not listening to me and this and that. And God is testing you. I want you to see the test. It's, it's easier to pass the test when you can see the test. So Holy Spirit, I ask that right now you can bring to their hearts and their minds how you're testing them. Show them. I want you to write it down. Lord, is it an extended season test? Kind of lift up your hand when you've got something God's spoken to you, a test in your life right now. Young people, I see you. Ezra, I see you. Bow your head. Lord, you show our youth how you're testing them. What's the test? Is it their siblings? Is it, what is the test? Show them, Lord. How, the Holy Spirit, I ask that you show us how to pass this test. We seek your counsel. We ask for wisdom. Give us wisdom. Lord, expose to us the trap of the enemy in the midst of this test. Show us how the enemy is trying to trap or has trapped the way out of the trap. Give us strength to endure. 
want you to write down what you're hearing, what you're seeing. Lord, what are you trying to, 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 to make of us in the midst of this? What characteristic, what character are you trying to put in us through this testing? Amen. Go ahead and stand up. I want to pray for you. Go ahead and lift up your hands. I'm just going to pray. You can pray this with me when I pray it for you. Say, say this with me. Say, Father God, give me wisdom. Show me the way that would please you to lead to the passing of this test and to the producing of Christ's likeness in my character. I want to be like you, so I rejoice in the midst of this test, this trial, Give me strength to endure. In Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people said, amen. Well, um, we're, we're going to be um, leaving this Friday. I really ask for your prayers with love. We're bringing several different churches with us. And uh, they don't necessarily carry, you know, some of them are completely different than Sozo. Some of them are close. So, some of them are the same. And so... Um, is that you have a word? Okay. Uh, I was here first service last week. Um, and thank you, George. I'd heard that. Anyways, um, I have a thousand dollars. They need two thousand something dollars. Come on. <laughs> Let's do it. Come on. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Janet. That's amazing. Lord, we just say thank you. Thank you for your provision, Lord. Thank you that you are a provider, Lord. I ask that you will continue to pour back into the laps. You said you would press down, shake together, bring it into our bosoms. So, Lord, we ask that you would do that. Bring it back to those who have sown it in. We just want to be a light to the nations, Lord. So we, we just thank you for your provision. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May he lead you by his spirit and fill you with his peace. In Jesus' name. Can I get the ministry team to come forward if you need prayer for anything? We'd love to pray for you. If you've got stuff going on, the enemy's resisting you. You just need strength. You need endurance. You need whatever it is. Uh, we'd love to pray for you. Listen, if you're being attacked in your dreams, stuff like that, we would love to pray to break that off of you. If you're dealing with infirmity, we'd love to pray for you. Break that off of you. If you. Whatever it is, if you need the Lord, we would love to join with you in prayer for that. God bless you guys. If you were blessed by this video, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.